Okay. Um, they knock. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, we're going to call the meeting to order. It's nine o'clock on Wednesday, January 16th. Um, our first order of business today is to take an opportunity to thank um, a number of people who are here for putting together this fabulous new look for the town room and having it be here for us as a new council. I kept hearing these wonderful little murmurs about how great the room looked and other people even came by and peeked in. Uh, but I have to say, I did not actually come into it until the first day that we sat down, which was Gen uh, December 3rd. Uh, it is amazing. It's uh, working beautifully and it makes us feel um, particularly special and what's really special is the idea that you were, the town was planning to put it out to bid, and many of you, uh, all of you said, no, wait a minute, we can do that work. And you did that work, and we are really appreciative of it. So with that, um, we're going to have just take a pause and do a little bit of ceremony, if you will, and then we'll move on to our regular program. Okay. Thank you, um, Lynn. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask, we have a little certificate for everybody um, who contributed, and you'll walk up and take it, and, but there are no acceptance speeches or anything like that for you. <laughs> so at the inauguration, I mentioned this story about how um, we were um, looking to reconfigure this room because we were figuring how do we get a council of 13 into a room and allow enough space for people to uh, participate in. And um, as we struggled through this, I mean, really, Rob Mora came up with the design and the um, sort of layout, and it seems to work. We looked at a lot of other communities that have uh, council meeting rooms, and uh, you know, they have lots of different models. Sometimes the council is elevated, like they're above everybody, and that wasn't the feel of Amherst, I don't think. So, um, but getting this room into shape was no easy task. Uh, we had to. Uh, design it and uh, build it and uh, so it could accommodate 13 people so they could basically see each other and also for the public to see them. We had to create the technology uh, so that the, everybody could see and that the public could see. And uh, we had to have this uh, room designed so that we could move forward uh, to a, towards more paperless uh, operations so that uh, everybody in the room could see the technology and the people at home could see what the council was looking at. So. Um, the people that we're going to recognize have worked during the during the workday, but in addition to their normal working duties. But many came in on nights and weekends as well. So, so we're going to start with DPW. So I want to call up our carpenters, Daryl Hager and Everett Bergman. If they're not here, I don't think they're going to be here. And then um, uh, Dakota Willis and Andy Cody. Huh? Oh. <laughs> okay. So, so we, we have a water issue down the street, and that's why some of our folks aren't here. Um, from facilities, Ralph is not here, I don't think. Uh, oh, Ralph is here. Okay, Ralph Hathaway. Uh, and John Mbimbo. And I know Mary Decker isn't here. I don't think she's here. She's, she's the person who um, is the night custodian for Town Hall, but she was in here every night after the people were working and during the time, and also consulting with us in terms of what would work for her, because she has to take care of the space every day. Every day. <laughs> as long as it's not too late. <laughs> um, so from IT, we have Sean Hannon, who, helped, who really did lead the charge. Uh, Brianna Sunrid. Bill Glover. Uh, Mike Warner.
Rich Dukiewicz. And James Saltis wasn't here. He's here, but he wasn't here to design it, but he saved the day on the first meeting, I think. So James, you get it one too. <laughs> um, from Inspection Services, we have um, Dave Waskiewicz. Dave Cody. Is he here? No, not here. John Thompson. And Rob Mora. So thank you, and we applaud your efforts here. Okay, are there any other announcements or proclamations at this point? Then we are going to move on. Um, Mr. Bockelman, would you like to introduce yes. the next round? Of yes, so our next, um, uh, uh, we're going to talk about human resources, folks. If you're leaving now, <laughs> you're going to miss out. <laughs> wow, how to clear a room. Um, so we're, we're, um, our next presentation in terms of our orientation is with human resources, and this is a special day. Uh, for two reasons. One is we have, um, this is the last week for Deb Radway, our long-term uh, Director of Human Resources. Uh, there's going to be an event at noon today. You're all welcome to stop by, and uh, we'll have our more for, sort of formal presentation of, of things to her at that point. Um, uh, so so that, that's an important thing. And then we also have the personnel board here, and I think just turn it over to Deb, who's going to carry forward with her presentation and talk about the H human, the personnel board. You have to, you want to push the button on the mic. And Tony, the last time I knew you, you were teaching at the university. Oh, there you. Are. you. <laughs> <laughs> So the Human Resources Department is the Human Resources Director, me, Joanne Mizjazic, the Benefits and Safety Manager, and jo uh, Jennifer Moyston, who is our, we share an administrative assistant with the town manager and you. Um, it is also the Town of Amherst Personnel Board, and we are having a personnel board meeting this morning and four of the five members of the personnel board are here, and they are Dr. Tony Butterfield, chair, Christopher Hoffman, representing the Library Board of Trustees, Rebecca Woodland, an appointed member, and maybe go way over there. Oh, yes. <laughs> the non union employees representative, Charles Sherpa, you might know him, former police chief. Um, so, and, excuse me, I would like to introduce Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg, who on March 4th is your new Human Resources Director. Welcome, Evelyn. She is here for her first official event. So HR, what do we do? We follow all kinds of state and federal laws, and also um, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, the health insurance laws, uh, wage and hour laws, the affirmative action laws, and we also follow the Amherst Town Charter, the Jones Library legislation, the personnel and human rights bylaws. We support all of these activities that you see up here. I'm not going to read them all. 
um, but our little two and a half person staff plus the personnel board does all of this for the town of Amherst. Um, in terms of the employee life cycle, we care for the town employees from when they're recruited to their retirement. And what does that really all mean? It means we, we work with the department heads to identify their functional area needs. We define and classify jobs, and we do this for the part-time hourly, for the um, seasonal, for the union positions, and for the non-union positions. We help develop and implement recruiting strategies and goals for each individual position, all focused on that overall overarching strategy of how do we attract and retrain a high performing workforce that reflects the diversity and the makeup of the community. That's our driving thought when we're looking for new staff. Um, we partner with employees to meet their needs, whether it's orientation, performance evaluations, counselings, talking about uh, professional development. We work with them and we also support retirees. We have 250 retirees in the town of Amherst and we support them as they transition out and throughout their retirement. We have six collective bargaining agreements in the town comprising 79% of the full-time staff, uh, two in police, the police supervisors and police patrol, two in the DPW, DPW supervisors and DPW rank and file, uh, fire union, and the administrative and, and technical staff in the SEIU. We also have 58 non-union employees comprising 21% of the full-time staff, they are confidential, professional, and managerial staff. Uh, the HR department is at the negotiating table for all of the collective bargaining agreements. Um, and uh, we have five agreements that expire next June 30th. We have one settled with fire through um, 2021. We also have four individual employment agreements with the fire chief, the police chief, the library director, and the town manager. One of the things that the HR department and the personnel board have set as a major priority is professional development. Of course, we're a college town. You can't have a limit on your professional development for your employees in a college town because everybody wants it and expects it. Professional de development um, helps people learn the core competencies of their jobs, provides career ladders, providing stretch opportunities for folks so that they can reach out and try and grasp that next rung on their ladder to, to advance themselves and their families. We provide group trainings, whether it's customer service or on some software program uh, or a safety training. We do all the legally required trainings, the sexual harassment policy training and all the other, and other policies that we have to by law offer. Uh, we try really hard to leverage the resources available at our colleges to help keep the cost of training down. We have trained over 45 supervisors and managers through the UMass Supervisory Leadership Development Program. Uh, we partner with Suffolk University on their executive management program in, Amherst, in Northampton right now. Uh, we partner with the Amherst College Safety Programs for OSHA-related trainings. We also have a very small educational reimbursement budget that we make available to folks who are pursuing work-related degrees. Tony, I've talked enough. <laughs> You want to talk about well, the, the board? The role of the personnel board, I think, is to support and enhance uh, that the HR function in the town be of the highest quality possible and, and support what uh, the HR director uh, does. And even more than that, to, to, to be ahead of the curve, to not just comply with 
regulations affecting uh, the employees who work for the town, um, but to uh, anticipate. Uh, and for example, from time to time, the legislature in the Commonwealth passes new laws affecting minimum wage or benefits for people who work in the private sector, and it's more or less been our policy, and the select board has supported that. Well, if we're asking the private sector to do that, the town ought to be paying the minimum wage and offering sick leave benefits as well. So we have always uh, adopted that, and with respect to the sick leave law that was passed a couple of years ago, we proposed our own enhancement to that, which we think fits the needs of the town and its employees uh, as well. We've had, uh, happily, a very collaborative relationship with the HR director uh, and the town manager. And usually there uh, is, there has been a liaison uh, from the late great select board to sit in on our meetings. And if the town council chooses to, to continue that uh, practice, I think we would be very uh, pleased about that. And all in all, we, we, uh, we, we have stated in writing that we want the town of Amherst to be an employer of choice in Western Massachusetts, and that our pay scale should be pegged actually at the 75th percentile of what communities in our area uh, are paying, and so far we've been able to do that. Thank you, I would also add that the 58 non-union staff view the personnel board as kind of their union rep. Um, they, the, the personnel board advocates and mediates and um, st very, it studies comparable benefits um, to make sure that we have a really attractive personnel package. And I echo what he said about a great relationship. So why should you care about morale? Because employee morale is one of the most important metrics that you use when you evaluate the town manager. How does he get along with his staff? And the HR department spends a lot of time working on employee recognitions, um, communications, and activities. We coordinate the meet up with the manager sessions every couple of months for him to meet privately in his office with five or six staff just kind of sharing what are they like, what are they, what are they frustrated about, what do they want from him. Uh, we put out employee newsletters. We announce all the employee changes and hires. Uh, we have potlucks for any, and as we are doing today at noon, absolutely no good reason. <laughs> and we are famous for them. They're really good. <laughs> if you've ever had David Burgess's corn dip. <laughs> Our employees are also very, very active in the Pioneer Valley, throughout the Pioneer Valley, supporting charities. Um, whether, whether it's, a, it's a bike ride, as you can see with the library staff there, or United Way, or, or Toys for, for Tots, or lots of, lots of different charities, um, that's a way that we can all work together um, towards, a, towards the common good. Uh, we also, HR department, um, coordinates all the employee-initiated celebrations, our summer picnics, our our employee years of service recognition. Um, so uh, when you're evaluating the town manager, ask him how he's doing on morale. And ask us. The other thing that, that we do is administer all the employee benefits um, for town employees and the retirees. Until this current year, we've had a health claims trust. We've been self-insured for health insurance. That has changed this year through Paul's leadership and the leadership of the Insurance Advisory Committee. We are now safely fully insured for our health insurance through the Maya uh, Trust and Blue Cross Blue Shield. We make insurance available to any employee who works throughout the year, 20 hours a week or more. We share the cost uh, with employees. 
And we also offer dental and disability plans that are 100% employee funded, but we get a group discount on the rates because we're a big group. We have a very active wellness committee that Joanne supports, uh, that puts on wellness committees. As you can see, we have in that lower picture, we're having a planking contest. I think Sandy Poole, no, Dave Zomack won that. <laughs> was that. Was that a politically correct response? <laughs> We have a very active insurance advisory committee that, that provides advice to the, trust the health trust administrator, who's, who's Paul, and that's comprised of a representative from every single town and school employee group plus the non-union group plus retiree groups. And finally, uh, workers' compensation and safety. We take safety really seriously in this town. We do a lot of safety training. We can always do more. Uh, we encourage all of our employees to report injuries. Don't hide anything. Don't try and be brave. We want, we want to know if you're, you're hurt. Uh, we participate in the Western Mass Safety Group trainings organized by Amherst College. And the reason why I'm really bringing this to your attention is that starting April 1st, certain OSHA standards are gonna start applying to municipalities throughout the state. And you're gonna be hearing more about the town's need to focus on meeting OSHA standards. And thus concludes my presentation. Thank you. Are there questions? I have one, and that is, at what is the plan to move to the minimum hourly wage of $15 an hour? Good question. The state has, through the grand bargain legislation that they passed last year, is increasing the minimum wage incrementally, um, 75 cents or a dollar every January 1st until 2023 when it's scheduled to go to $15 an hour. Okay. Our library and LSSE staffs are the one, there are, those are the departments that are most impacted by this. So we've worked pretty hard with them to try and mitigate the impact so they look at their staffing models um, because this, is, this, this costs them money and they gotta manage within it. So 2023 would be the latest mm -hmm. to get to $15 an hour. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Kathy. Hi, um, I'm wondering on the training programs and career advancements, does the town get any special uh, rebates or free tuition from either UMass or Amherst College? I know, for example, when my son was in the high school, he was able to take calculus at UMass. He just took the cor he took the course. I did. Does have has anything like that been extended to town employees? Individually, not collectively. It depends on the program. It depends on the individual. Okay. Additional questions? We want to thank you for your many, many years of service. Some of us may see you later, but um, it's particularly terrific to see somebody have enjoyed their job, done what you've done, and we, we hope you enjoy the next phase of your life. Thank you very much, it's been a blast. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bachman. Thank you. Uh, so next we have a presentation from our finance department and as you'll see from their presentation, it's really a finance team. They're, and I think that's what's sort of the, the power of our um, financial department is that there are a lot of people who know a lot and have worked for the town for a number of years. And so I think you can feel confident that uh, you've got some experienced people who um, are presenting to you. So start with Sonia Aldridge, who is our interim finance director and our comptroller, and has been here a couple years, I think. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I won't lie to you. I'm extremely nervous. And when I'm nervous, I mix up my words. It started this morning when I told my husband that the, clo the sink clog was drained, and he just looked at me. <laughs> Um, on behalf of the finance department, finance team, I'd like to thank, thank you for the opportunity to, oh, 
to present the overview of the finance department and the processes. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the finance team. I'm Sonia Aldrich. I'm the comptroller. This is David Burgess. He is the principal assessor. Uh, Holly Bowser, assistant comptroller. Jen LaFountain, acting collector. Sherry Boucher, acting treasurer. And Anthony, our procurement officer. Collectively, the five of us, not including Anthony, We've been here 132 years, so you have 132 years of experience sitting here. I've been here for 32 years myself. I started in the collector's office in 1987 and transferred to the accounting department in, in August of that same year. I worked my way up the ladder, and I've been in this position for 20 years. Uh, what the slide up here sh just shows the finance team. What it doesn't show here as a partner are the schools. We work very collaboratively with the schools. They are a part of our finance team, and I just felt it was important to mention that. This is, this is a quick overview of the um, finance process, finance department, excuse me. This is a quick overview of how the process flows in the finance department, and this is in the order of the presentation. The assessors, sets the tax rate and values the property. The collector sends bills and receives the payments. The treasurer deposits and invests the money. Accounting monitors, controls, and pays the bills. And we do a really good job of that, just so you know. And the finance director uses all this information to forecast future budgets by analyzing the trends in revenues, expenditures, amongst many other factors. And now I'll turn it over to David to go through the assessor. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Burgess, and I have been your principal assessor for 28 years. I've worked in appraisal and assessing for 36 years altogether. As you can see in my office, there's myself and two administrative staff. The administrative staff are Laurie Tarati, who's been with me for 20 years, and Teresa Boothlet, who has been here for 22. As you're going to hear throughout this uh, presentation experience is uh, predominant in this finance department. The major, uh, we have the assessor's duties listed on the uh, board above you. Um, I'm not going to touch on them all. The major duty of the assessing office is to fairly and equitably value all the real estate and personal property in the town of Amherst every year for tax purposes. For the real estate, this means that we are going to compare the properties that have sold in the prior calendar year to our assessed valuations to see what level we are at. We are required to be at a level of 10% of market value, plus or minus by the Department of Revenue, and we do that every year. Every fifth year, uh, we put up with the arduous uh, attention of the Department of Revenue when they come in to certify our values. Uh, through a lengthy process, they will come in every, as I say, fifth year. It used to be every third year up until 19, 2018. Uh, and they certify that we were within market value of, of state guidelines of the 10%. The assessor will meet with you all again uh, once every fall. Uh, you will be helping us set with classification hearing, at which time we will determine if we're going to have one or two uh, tax rates for commercial, industrial, and residential. Um, at this meeting, we will advise you what the levy limit is, that the amount of money we're going to have, and the tax rate. I will mention the uh, tax, the levy limit calculation later as another part of this presentation when we talk about property in two and a half. Our other duties include the processing of motor vehicle excise bills, the calculation of the bid bills, Processing all personal exemptions for seniors, veterans, blind, and surviving spouses. The assessing department also covers the town of Pelham. We have an agreement with them, and we've been working with them for about eight years. Uh, we uh, do all of the same duties for the town of Pelham. And one of my staff uh, works with the collector's office covering the central counter. The principal assessor, that's me, uh, we, uh, I staff the board of assessors who meet once a month, uh, uh, regularly, and these are the signing authority for all our, we do. With that in mind, I'm going to turn this over now to Jen LaFountain. She is our collector, and she will give you an overview of the collections. 
Good morning. Good morning. So, I'm Jennifer LaFelton. Could, could you lean more into the mic? Thanks. Sure. Um, Thank is that you. better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm the acting collector, and I've been with the town for almost 20 years. I began part-time um, in the collector's office and working Saturdays at the landfill, weighing in trucks and taking money for disposal um, until my position became full-time in, in the collector's office. Um, I've, I put myself through UMass Eisenberg part-time until I completed my bachelor's degree in business management while working full-time with the town. Along with me, there is just over two and a half other personnel in the collector's office. Cindy's been with the town 31 and a half years. Susan's been with us 22 years, and Christina's been with us at our front counter since November. The collector portion of our department is responsible for issuing most of the town's billing. We are heavily regulated by Massachusetts general law for the majority of it. All of our billing is processed and managed in-house, and it's truly a group effort to generate and mail it all in a timely manner. We work in collaboration with the assessor's office for our tax billing, the real estate, and excise tax. We rely on and work with other departments to provide information to create the bills listed here under other billing. The collector's office is responsible for more than just the bills, though. We are the first point of contact when entering the town hall. Um, we help people find the area that they need to be at, whether it's for a license for um, a marriage license or an uh, inspections permit. Um, four of the staff, and one of them being from the assessor's office, staff our central service counter in addition to their other office duties ensuring a pleasant experience when visitors come to town hall. Parking permits are issued at our front counter and we assist people with appeal information when looking to contest a ticket. I also provide in-person hearings the first Friday morning of each month. Timely billing and posting of payments is also very important. Not only is it regulated by Mass General Law, it maintains a constant revenue stream for the town. The collector creates a deposit to be turned over to the treasurer, which then gets posted to the general ledger in accounting. The treasurer and collector also work together whenever property tax bills remain unpaid. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Sherry Boucher, our acting treasurer. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Boucher, the acting treasurer, assistant treasurer at this moment. Um, you I've worked the, with- Pull the, the mic towards you a little bit, thank you. Yep, I've worked with the town of Amherst for 33 years. I started in the collector's office in 1985, um, worked 18 years with them in the office, and now working with the treasurer's office for 15 years. Um, we're still all together, so I do still work collectively with the collector staff and um, customer inquiries. Um, we need to have you move in further. Thanks, Paul. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I also work closely with um, the accounting office with payroll and accounts payable. Um, many of the tr treasurer's functions are mandated by Mass General Law. This list is just a portion of what the treasurer's duties are. Um, we don't have time today to go over everything. There's, there's a lot. Um, I'd like to talk about investments. Um, among the most important duties of the treasurer is maintaining the town's investments. Um, the treasurer invests the money that is received by the collector's office in various departments, grants, um, funds, and ensuring the best possible return for the town, whether it be CDs, um, bonds, treasurer notes. Um, the returns from these investments help maintain the town's cash flow. Um, the sound management of the town money aids in maintaining our strong bond with rating currently AA+. We feel that this quote from our last bond rating in February 2004 2015 really encapsulates the strength and responsibility of the entire finance team. Um, the quote, we believe that Amherst's continued strong management will allow the town to maintain strong budgetary flexibility commensurate with its formal policies and practices throughout the economic cycle. Moreover, the town's strong economy and diverse property tax base should allow for revenues to remain strong and consistent. Um, an endorsement like this could only be the result of strong teamwork and thorough planning from everyone involved in the finance department. Um, one of my teammates, Holly Bowser, who will speak next to you, will take over. Sorry. Good morning. 
Um, like she said, my name is Holly Bowser. I've worked for the town uh, just a few months shy of 20 years. I also started in the collector's office. I worked my way up to a supervisor and then the um, assistant tax collector before I transferred to accounting and became the assistant comptroller almost 15 years ago. Um, this slide shows our organizational chart in our office. We have five full-time employees. Sonia, the comptroller, who you heard about earlier. Myself, assistant comptroller. Teresa, our payroll and benefits um, coordinator, has been with the town 30 years. Kim, our accounts payable clerk, has been with the town for 22 years. And finally, our procurement officer, Anthony, has been with, the, with us for about a year and a half. He has also shared with the schools and the enterprise funds um, as well to do their procurements. And he's sitting here helping us this morning. He doesn't have a speaking part, but he was very, very integral in putting this presentation together and the slides together. So we want to thank him. So now we're going to go into a little bit about what we do. Um, again, we have many responsibilities in the accounting office. I, I'm just going to highlight a few today. Um, payroll, which not only means paying all of our employees on time and accurately and according to policies, procedures, their collective bargaining agreements and applicable federal and state laws around employment, um, but also all the benefits that are associated with our employees. Teresa works very closely with the retirement board and all of our retirees. Um, including their benefits as well. Um, when they have insurance questions, they come in, they're looking for Teresa to help answer those questions. Um, she also works closely with the schools, balancing our monthly health insurance. Um, everything is balanced every month to the penny through our health insurance deductions. Um, accounts payable is responsible for getting all of our vendors paid on time. Working with the vendors, assisting departments with late notices, billing discrepancies, any research that may need to be done. Um, as well as monitoring budgets and the amounts available to make sure that the bills can be paid. Um, our office reviews all invoices paid by the town. Every invoice comes through our office and is reviewed. Um, we also print both the payroll and the AP checks for the elementary schools um, because they are on our books as well. The elementary schools are part of the general fund budget and their, their books are all mixed in with ours. Um, procurement is a very important and time-consuming role. This um, includes bidding, quotes, requests for proposals, contracts, purchase orders, and always, always making sure that we're complying with uh, the Uniform Procurement Act and state laws around bidding. These laws are constantly being updated, so having a full-time person that's dedicated to this is extremely important to us. Invalid bidding and contracting procedures are very troublesome and potentially embarrassing. They are a place that we certainly don't want to be. Uh, we oversee the annual independent audit. We are constantly checking, reviewing trends, verifying, and we do audit this, audits in-house as well between the treasurer's office and myself, mostly Sherry nowadays. <laughs> Um, we proof for accuracy all the collector and treasurer batches before they get posted to our general ledger. We're responsible for financial and state reporting, federal and state grant oversight. We're the keeper of records for all grants. And that's just a few of the things that we do. Even the list that's up there on the wall does not include everything. It's impossible. I mean, there's five full-time employees. We, we do a lot of work. Um, so on the next slide, we also are very... Um, involved in the budget process, even more so now. Over the past several years, Sonia has been the acting finance director, and myself have been um, recently training and working very closely with our budget analyst who puts all those numbers and all those spreadsheets and all those things together to make that budget. And we've spent a lot more time on the budget over the last few years. From start to finish, from creating it to adopting it to balancing it and entering everything in our software system and, and matching all the votes and making sure everything balances to the penny there. Um, and then there's the everyday budgetary control, monitoring of the town's budget. We provide monthly budget reports to departments. We work and assist all the departments on their individual de um, budgets as well as the overall budget. Um, there is barely a day that goes by that one of us is not thinking about the budget in some fashion. It's on our minds all the time. Um, we also provide staff assistance to the Community Preservation Act Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia to now go over part of that budget process. Thank you. Is this on still? Yeah. Okay. This is a flow chart of our budgeting process. 
A very wise man once said, there's seven steps to a good budget process. And I'll give you a hint, he used to work here. <laughs> um, forecast, allocate, meet and refine. Meet and refine is where we're at today in the process for fiscal year 20. Finalize, present, that would be the town manager's purview, and then adopt would be the council's role, and then monitor, which just goes back to the comptroller role. This is a condensed version of the projection sheet included in the indicators report presented to the four boards in October, in last October. This is the general fund only, and it's important to note that this is a working projection. We, this is constantly changing as we get more, inform, more precise information, such as the governor's budget, which will be coming out at the end of this week. There's two sections to this projection, revenues and expenditures. We're going to start with the revenues. There's four categories in revenues, property tax, local receipts, state aid, and other financing sources. This is a pie chart. It's a nice visual um, to see the four categories and their percentages. Slide. As you can see, property tax is the largest slice of the pie at 65%. Property tax is the most reliable source of revenue that we have. However, it does have its limitations as well, and that would that's what we commonly refer to as Prop 2 and a half. Dave Burgess will go into greater detail of this later in the presentation. The second largest uh, revenue source is state aid at 20%. It's been around 20% since 2012, but future growth or reduction remain uncertain. State aid comes through on the cherry sheet, and there's two parts to the cherry sheet. Estimated receipts, which include Chapter 70 funds, which is school-related funds, unrestricted general government aid, commonly known as UGA. Estimate, and then the second part of the cherry sheet are estimated assessments or charges, if you will. And these include regional transit assessments and school choice and charter payments. Net state aid is receipts less assessments or charges. This is what the amount we actually have to appropriate for the operating budgets. It's great when we get more receipts, but usually it comes with increased charges as well, so kind of levels off. The third category is local receipts. There's, there are both stable and unstable revenue sources and local receipts are economically driven sources such as investment income, licenses and permits, and motor vehicle excise. In a good economy, people are spending money, they're buying new cars, they're going on vacations, they're adding porches and stuff onto their houses, which brings in more revenue. In a slower, sluggish economy, that revenue tends to go down. Our reliable sources are our municipal fees and charges, fines, rental income, or penalties and interest. Stuck here. The final category is other financing sources. This includes free cash and stabilization fund, transfer some other funds as ambulance receipts. We use ambulance receipts to help support our public safety operating budget, overlay surplus, and I'll get into that a little more later on in the thing. And our administrative overhead, our enterprise funds pay an administrative fee to the general fund. Back to our projection. We'll now focus on the expenditures. This is also in four categories. Operating budgets, capital budget, which includes debt payment, debt service payments, fixed miscellane and miscellaneous costs, and unappropriated uses. Again, the pie chart show the visual. The largest expense in our, in our budget is to the operating budgets, the town and school elementary operating budgets, the region assessment that we pay, and the library tax support. Each budget includes operating exp salaries, operating expenses, and health insurance benefits. Capital. 
Currently, we have capital funding projected at 9.5% of the levy. Capital pays for debt service and cash capital. This pays for general fund debt only in what we call cash capital. And cash capital is the, um, we take 9.5% of the tax levy and then we pay our debt service and what's left is what we can actually pay cash for, for capital. So if our debt goes up, our cash capital is going to go down. In addition to the, to the above allocation, we can issue bonds, use reserves, state and federal grants such as, such as Chapter 90 pays for road repairs, and ambulance receipts have been used to buy ambulances and medical equipment. The next is uh, fixed and miscellaneous costs, and these include retirement and retirement and OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits. The final category is um, unappropriated costs, and these include state assessments we talked about earlier from the cherry sheet, reserves for abatements and exemptions, otherwise known as overlay. And we are, we're required to raise between 1% and 3% of the tax levy to set aside to pay for abatements and exemptions, and also our tax work-off people get paid from that. We've always used 1%. That's been sufficient since we have such a great assessor here that does a really good job valuing properties. There's really not that much of a discrepancy. Um, and if there's any of that left over in the, in the subsequent years, the, um, assessing, the Board of Assessors can declare a surplus. And we can use that as a funding source within the current year that we declared it. At the end of the year, it will fall to free cash. And then other amounts to be raised. And that includes things like tax title. We're required to raise money to process tax titles and uh, our assessment to the Pioneer Valley Planning Collaborative. And I didn't say much about the enterprise funds. I wanted to, the enterprise funds are, are self-sufficient. They run like a private business. Uh, we have water, sewer, solid waste, and transportation at the moment for enterprise funds. They pay administrative fees to the general fund. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about all of these in the future. And now I can hand it back to David on the Prop 2 and a half. The good news is that the musical chairs are about to finish. Uh, I want to go over the Move the mic closer, please. Thank you. Very briefly, I'm going to discuss Proposition 2 and a half. These are the basics. And one thing I want to point out right up front, Proposition 2 and a half does not refer to anyone's individual taxes. Proposition 2 and a half allows us to raise 2 and a half percent over the levy limit from the previous year. In other words, the amount of money we spent. And then that is apportioned over the, everyone else. Over the, and that can be impacted by changing values or changing market or demolitions or improve, improvements. Um, everything is under the levy limit except for three classes. We have an over, two types of override. We have the general op override, which is an operating override, and that becomes a permanent part of the budget moving forward. We have a capital override, which is generally for one year. We may use that for buying a truck for the VPW the fire, or the fire department or someone like that. And that comes off at the end of the ter at the end of the capital expense, which is, as I say, one year for capital. It's a short-term borrowing, and then the debt exclusion, and the debt exclusion lasts for the life of any borrowing that we do. In other words, if we do any schools or any new buildings or something like that, 25 or 30 years, this will be on the tax bill for 25 or 30 years, and over and above anything we raise on the levy limit. It's part of it's outside the levy limit, as we say. I'm not going to try and go into a whole discussion on Proposition 2.5, but we have provided a link for the Proposition Primer 2.5 that's uh, been the, uh, sourced by the Department of Revenue and is very good for many years. They do an excellent job with their presentations. So that's on there. You can see that. The, pro the general calculation for Proposition 2.5 uh, for the levy limit, how we come up with the levy limit for the next year is that we 
take the previous year's levy limit, we add the Proposition 2.5 amount that we're allowed, or in other words, 2.5% of that levy limit. We add on any new growth, and that gives us the amount of money we have for the year to spend, excluding any debt exclusions, capital exclusions, or uh, operating budget overrides. New growth is a large part of this, and we are averaging 606,000 over the last 10 years on a basis. The other thing we do, and we're going to be talking to you about this at the classification hearing that I mentioned earlier, and we'll also go into a lot more term, uh, explanation of the terminology for the budget at the classification hearing, but we're going to determine uh, whether to limit the tax and how much we can spend. We'll have the option of whether we spend to the limit or the amount that we are allowed to or not, and generally Amherst has done that over the last, my 28 years, we've always spent to the limit. The last slide that we have, or sorry, the last slide that I have, shows you how uh, new growth can impact the uh, tax rate, or the levy limit rather. As you can see, over this three year period, we had large swings in the new amount of new growth. Everything else is fairly standard. For FY17, we saw a 62% increase in new growth over the previous year. That's because we got a large payment from the uh, electric companies. That'll only happen once in a blue moon, so that doesn't really impact it. And then it's stabilized the next year and come down to about 730,000. This year, we expect to see it up slightly because uh, you may have noticed there's a couple of buildings getting put up in town, <laughs> rather large. So we'll be including those, and we'll be including a portion of Beacon Properties, and then all the regular new growth that's going on in town, and personal property. Can I? Uh, we were just going to do something. Uh, the last page is, shows a lot of uh, links that we have for the different departments and schools uh, that our IT department has put on. And they are very good, and they'll give you a lot more explanations. And with that, we'd like to throw it open to his questions. I'm sorry to cut you off, but. <laughs> Steve, question. But the, so the new buildings are, would be FY19 or FY18? They'll be, they'll be, actually, they'll be spread out over the years because we assess what is there on June 30th. Gotcha. So if they're only partially finished, we'll pick up that amount, and then we'll pick up the rest later on uh, the next year. So it could be over two years. That's why. You know, someone may say to me, that's an $18 million uh, building. You should have $400,000 in new growth. It's not going to happen because it's not all going to be done by June 30th. Over the two years, it could be $400,000. I have a test. Do you know why it's called the cherry sheet? Because of the color of the paper was printed on originally? That's right. Exactly. I've been here a long time, too. Yes. <laughs> And my previous organization used to run the Cherry Sheet Conference every year. So that's why I, most people hear the word Cherry Sheet and they go, huh? What's a, what's a sheet? <laughs> it was literally before computers. It was like handed PDF. to you on a cherry colored sheet. That's a physical PDF. Yes. <laughs> that is it. Yes. Andy Trump. Um, with new growth, um, we have a lot of tax-exempt educational institutions that have been doing a lot of building. Does their new growth go into our tax levy at all, or because they're tax-exempt, do, does it stay out? It stays out. Yeah. Right. Andy. Yeah, there's one piece of two and a half you didn't mention. That's the levy ceiling. And... Uh, uh, where we are in relation to um, how the inflation is going to approach us to the levy ceiling eventually, what that means. All right. What Mr. Steinberg is referring to, there's a figure, it's called the levy ceiling, quite rightly, and the levy ceiling is 2.5% of the total valuation of the town, so it changes as the valuation of the town uh, goes up or down. And we do sometimes go down because of deflation. Um, at the moment, our levy ceiling is somewhere about $52 million. And our amount of money we're raising, and this is shooting total, no, I'm not, hold on just a second. Uh, I was going to say it was shooting blind, but that's not quite true. And we're at uh, 
For FY18, we're at $50 million on our levy limit, so we still have about $2 million in taxes that we can play with, 2 or $3 million that we can play with. Our tax rate last year was $21.80. I would expect that it's going to go down a little bit this year, and this is very early news, so the valuations have gone up considerably in the last uh, cycle, so I'm considering that we may raise the valuations. As values go up, the levy ceiling will go up, and the tax rate will come down. This is something I was going to explain in more detail at the tax classification hearing that we do. Uh, Mr. Steinberg and Ms. Brewer are very familiar with it because of the number of times that they've heard me at the meetings. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions? Probably more than we can anticipate. Yes, Shalini. Are the property taxes from buildings that are rented out considered residential or commercial? Very good question. Massachusetts uh, considers everything that's residential, and that's the, including the mixed-use buildings that are getting built at the moment. The upper floors that are all residential will be valued as residential property. The lower levels will be valued as commercial property. And that, again, is one of the things and I'm not quite sure, I keep saying the full council, I don't know if it's going to be the full council or the finance committee that decides uh, when we meet, but that's one of the things we'll discuss because each year you're going to have to decide if we are going to tax the commercial properties at a different level than we do the residential properties. And we haven't done that in the past because we only run about 10% commercial. There's very little commercial valuation. But hotels, sorry, hotels are considered commercial, apartment complexes are not. Okay, thank you. Ad additional questions? Yes, Kathy. Uh, just to follow up on that, so if you have a large building that the top floors are residential and the bottom is commercial, and you had two rates, which we don't now, they would be paying at two rate levels? Correct. For the first floor, they'd pay one rate, and for everything else, they'd pay another? That is correct, yeah. And then do you assess the property value, so um, if the first floor that's supposed to have commercial in it is empty right now, and then it starts to get used. Does it change the valuation of that commercial property? Depends on why it's empty. If it's empty because the person uh, wants to charge too high a rent, we're not going to change it. We don't allow for bad management. Okay. Uh, we create a model. If I'm going to look along Main Street, I'm going to look what retail sells for or pays their um, rents for, and uh, office rents for, all of those things. And if someone chooses to put their value way up, or their requirement for rent way up above and can't fill the vacancy, that's their choice. We're still going to value it at the uh, level of everyone else. If there's a reason that the building's not going because it's old or has not been maintained or brought up to date, then we will adjust it, yes. Um. Who manages our investments? Does the town or do we have an investment manager? Sonia? We have an, we have an investment manager. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay. Okay. Yes, Shalini. So one of the things I heard during my campaigning was from seniors and uh, who are on fixed income and, and struggle with the property taxes. Have you ever considered having a differential rate for seniors on limited income? Is that even a possibility? There's nothing in state law that allows us to do that. However, Amherst has been very uh, active over the years and we provide the largest exemptions possible for all classes of seniors, veterans, blind, and all the rest of it. And we also um, provide our tax work off that's got a generous limit, and we provide uh, help for 35 people in that up to $1,500 a year. Huh. But Amherst has also allowed that we will uh, as much as double the state amount for the uh, elderly, and which I assume you're talking about mostly, yeah, yeah. Uh, and all the other classes of property. And our long-term uh, applicants 
are nearly all at the 100% mark now. So they've gone up considerably over the years. For example, uh, the state limit for the uh, elderly at 70, for se 70 and over is $1,000. And before I go any further, there are income guidelines for that as well. Uh, so Amherst allows $2,000. So we, we've been doing very well. Former town managers and this town manager have always pushed it. Just a follow up question. Are these deductions um, expected to be known by people? Like, would most seniors know that these deductions are available? <laughs> they, we have them on our website, and I work very close with the um, Council on Aging, who regularly send out their um, uh, bulletin, and we put something on it nearly every year, and we uh, encourage people to come and do it. At the moment, and we might as well take this as an advertising, people have until about the 30th of March to uh, complete an application in my office so we can review it. And we will provide guidelines and uh, happy to help anyone that comes in to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, you wanted to add to that, please? Yes. I just wanted to also mention that at our central service counter, when people come in to pay, if there's any expression of um, financial hardship, we, we do make every effort to work with the assessor's office to give them all the information on those exemptions and abatements that they might be eligible for. So that's a, a big part of what we do at our front counter. We try to help people with that and educate them on their bills and work on payment options for people that really might be struggling. And does that include people who may have a change in circumstances? Um, divorce being one of the biggest ones I've heard of people talking about. Um, we, we make our best effort to, to work with them as much as possible, mm -hmm. um, depending on what the needs are. Um, there's there's some bills that we just, like ex motor vehicle excise, we have to accept payment in full. It's, it's the state law. But as far as real estate payments, we, um, we do work with them. Sherry has a, a direct debit program that she's been, that's been here since, what, 1992? 1992. And um, she can work out a monthly payment plan for them to help them stay current with their taxes. Okay. Thank you. Sonia, what is the administrative fee percentage? Uh, do you know what that is, Holland? The administrative fee, the percentage. For the enterprise Yes. You can get back to us on that one. It does, you know. Yeah, um, I certainly don't know it off the top of my head. It's a very large calculation. It takes into account um, a percentage of the town manager's time, a percentage of the accountant's time, a percentage of the assessor's time, a percentage of the um, um, collector's time. It's a very large calculation, so it's not like it's 5% or 3%, it's percentages of each department in the amount of time that they spend supporting those. Right. Um, I can say that the water and sewer funds, being our larger enterprise mm -hmm. funds, uh, it's somewhere in the vicinity of 300 to 400,000 that they give back to the um, general fund each yeah. year. And with the parking enterprise fund, which is much smaller, it's somewhere in the vicinity of about 100 to $150,000 a year that they give back. But it's a, it's a very complicated calculation. It's not just a straight percent. And is, is it federally negotiated or? It is not. It is a policy and procedure that we have had in place for quite some time. Um, you know, again, based on the amount of time that different departments spend working in those funds. And some people are directly, um, allocated to mm -hmm. an enterprise yes. fund. So, you know, we have to take that into consideration too. Great, thank you. Yes, Sonia? And I just wanna point out that it is in the budget book in all of the enterprise funds. It shows the administrative fee and where the, what the calculation is. And it's many different percentages depending on, on what it is in here, but it's all right there in the budget okay. book. Okay, thank you. Shalini. Um So for um, major improvement, what are what is the criteria for deciding how to prioritize and 
For example, if a bridge was broken down, <laughs> what you know? How would you decide whether that's a priority, and where would the funding come from when it's not expected? Deciding the priority is not my job. That's the town manager's job and the council's job. So I, I wouldn't do that. Um, they would come to me after the fact to see what is the best way to fund that, and I would do some research and get back to them. Okay. And, and the funding for that would come out of, that would also be determined by the town council and town manager, or? It would be determined by the council and town manager with my advice, yes. Okay. Additional questions? Yes, uh, Darcy. I have another question about um, investment, and I'm wondering if uh, if you have taken in under consideration either your in your in-house investing or with your financial managers um, socially responsible investing I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that the, I think yes go ahead I stab at that we don't have um, State law regulates what we can invest in. It's very, what the town can invest in is very regulated. Um, f many years ago, people were putting money into funds that were derivatives and things like that, and a lot of towns lost a lot of money. So the, the state really cracked down on what towns and treasurers were allowed to put money into. That being said, it is within the realm uh, possibility of the town, I believe, to set standards for what types of investments uh, we, we put in so we don't I don't think we really have policies and I'm not really sure if the retirement uh, Board has policies on socially responsible investments saying that we will only invest in green technologies or or Not invest in fuel companies or something like that, right? Um, our investor has a legal list that he can go by and mostly it's CDs and Treasury notes mutual bonds um, he, They don't stray far from those because it, it, we're trying to stay in the safe zone. It sounds, Darcy, like that's a more in-depth question because as we know, mutuals can be of various kinds, so. Right. Okay. And the, the choice of financial manager can be the choice, if you're deciding to invest uh, in a socially responsible way, a lot of that is connected to the, your choice of financial manager. Correct, and the town does look at that um, periodically. Uh, two years ago, we did go outside and look at other investment companies and people, and ended up staying with who we had. Um, he's been doing a very good job for the town, and that's where uh, Claire McGinnis stayed with our firm. Who's our financial manager? Abbey Capital, um, Rich Rogers. Uh, we've been working with him as long as I've been in the with the treasurer's office the last 15 years. Okay. Other questions? Yes, I'm sorry, Evan. Thank you. Uh, so I'm looking at the slide. It's 10-year average annual new growth, $606,000. Um, the chart we have up there for uh, 16, 17, 18, all of those are above. Granted, FY17 is a sort of aberrant data point. Um, but I'm just sort of curious, um, given many of the new projects uh, going up in, in town, on university, uh, in North Amherst, uh, is there an expectation that uh, new growth for the, in the foreseeable near future uh, will generally exceed that 10-year average of 606,000? Yes, over the next, at least over the next two years. Uh, you know, you're quite right. There's a new growth in University Drive. There's a new growth in North Amherst, uh, and in the centre. Uh, well, there's going to be new growth on Spring Street and other areas around here. The, we've already uh, collected the new growth for the One East Pleasant Street, so that's already in there. That was in that big year. Uh, so yes, there is an expect expectation that it'll be a little bit higher. Okay. Additional questions. I'm sure there's going to be many over time, and we're going to be actually having our first meeting of the finance subcommittee of the board. 
uh, later today. So uh, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for everything you do for us and for the presentation. Sonia, you weren't too nervous, really. <laughs> Good job. Back to our seats, and we'll begin. Welcome. Um, Sharon is our library director. Many of you already know her, so proceed. I'm going to go for it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Push the button off. There we go. I'm glad you had a chance to have a break. Um, I really respect the amount of work that you're putting into all of this, and um, wow. So I'm going to start today at the beginning. Why are libraries important? So no matter what services libraries are providing today, five years down the road, 20 years down the road, the most important aspect of library services is working with the public. We are in the people business, and books are actually secondary to the patrons that we serve. In any municipality, the public library is the town's living room. We are a community center. It's where the community comes to connect, grow, play, and share. Public libraries are vital economic anchors in any town. We have 300,000 people walking through our door every year. And when they're done con conducting library business, they're lingering and spending money in the town. They're feeding the meters, they're eating lunch, they're making photocopies, they're buying coffee. Uh, the library's central location supports local businesses and information. This is why libraries will never go out of business. It's because we provide information. Information can, become, can be informational or it can be recreational. And it comes in many different formats. We as humans have gone from cave drawings to books, six track tapes to streaming, and from VHS tapes to Netflix. And who knows what's gonna happen in the next five to 10 years. But regardless of the technological advancements, societies will always need information Humans are always going to need to interact with other humans, and so libraries will always be here to provide those things. Which leads me to the social justice aspect of public libraries. So in every community, there's always going to be the haves and the have-nots. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the beauty of government is that we're pooling our resources and distributing them evenly. And it's a really powerful concept. So regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, or economic background, our town is gonna put out your fire, catch the bad guys, plow your streets, and give you free access to books and technology. When the shelters are closed, libraries serve as essential warming centers during the winter and cooling centers during the summer. And then there's the technology piece. I don't know if you've noticed, but technology is expensive. But access to technology is a requirement in this day and age. And libraries are the only places in town where you can stay as long as you want, use the resources, and never have to bring your wallet. So what makes the Jones unique? Several things. I always say the staff. I believe that the li the, the, our patrons are coming to the library because of the staff. We are the 20th busiest library in the state. That's not an insignificant statistic. With the exception of Springfield, all those other libraries that are doing more business than we are are out by Boston, Worcester, and then they're all around Boston. Um, all of our three buildings look like very sweet little cozy homes, but on the inside, they are used in astronomical numbers, and that says a lot about this community. The Jones also offers services that are not provided by very many other public libraries, especially all at once, the way that we do. So our special collections archive, this is bringing, because it's in a public library, it is bringing the history of the town to the people. We have a dedicated art gallery, which is bringing art for free to the people. And we have an award-winning ESL program, which is contributing to integrating our immigrants into this community. Then there's our programming, which is top notch. I don't think there's a day that goes by when we don't have at least one or two programs going on. And we have two beloved branch libraries. This last piece, uh, this long history of private support that we receive from this community, not every public library has that support. The Jones was founded 100 years ago this year because of a private benefactor. He donated, I think the number in today's dollars is 16 million. Um, but because of that, because that practice continues today, we are able to provide the types of services that most other libraries cannot. 
So governance. Uh, the Jones Library is part town department and part its own corporation. Our six elected trustees hire the library director, oversee the endowment, and set library policy. And as the library director, I hire the staff, oversee expenditures and collections, and enforce library policy. All library staff are Town of Amherst employees. Uh, and I wanted to also note that every, every other town department helps the library. So everybody that you just spoke with works with the library. Uh, you know, accounting, the town manager's office, HR, all, all uh, library staff are hired through HR leisure services, the senior center, and I'm gonna leave people out, the health, the health, um, uh, yeah, sure. department, thank you. Uh, police, fire, DPW, uh, we are all, um, the library is supported by all of these departments. The buildings, on the other hand, this, this is where things get a little complicated. Um, there are, I get a lot of questions about this. So the Jones Library trustees own the Jones Building and the property that it sits on. Library staff manage the daily cleaning of the building and the grounds. The North Amherst Library, on the other hand, is owned by the town of Amherst and the property it sits on. The, the library trustees do not pay rent there. Library staff are responsible for cleaning the North Amherst Library, and both the library staff and town staff work together to maintain the grounds. And then there's the Munson Library building, which is owned by the town of Amherst. The library pays rent annually to the town of Amherst in order to be able to offer library services there. The town staff are responsible for the daily cleaning and the grounds. Okay, next I wanna talk a bit about trends and holdings and circulation. Uh, the four charts you see on the screen mimic nationwide trends and they tell part of a story. So on the left, you see the number of physical books. Brianna, oh, oh, I have to hold it, okay. So here, so this is the number of physical books owned by the Jones Library System, which has decreased. But the size of our e-content, the, the collection size, has increased exponentially. On the right, you can see that the circulation of our physical books has decreased but the circulation of our e-content has e increased exponentially. So there are lots of reasons why the nationwide, uh, for the nationwide decline of print book usage. Uh, certainly our Google machines have contributed to this decline, as well as budget cuts. Public libraries across the country have not recovered from the 2008 recession. We are all weeding according to industry standards, slowly, methodically, but we are unable to replace those items as quickly because there just isn't enough money. Uh, so there are fewer books on the shelves available for checkout. Technology is another piece of this puzzle. So it is changing at the speed of light right now. Uh, so because of this, libraries are having to purchase the same book in many different formats. So that one John Grisham that we used to buy in regular print and large print, we're also having to buy it on book on CD and play away and digital. And so it, it's eating up the book budget more quickly. One other point I wanna make about the circulation stats uh, has to do with the statistics themselves. So for all our digital content, we have to run circulation reports. And this content is provided by lots of different vendors. And of course, each vendor reports those statistics differently, which makes it hard for librarians to compile and then analyze the data, because we're not always comparing apples to apples. So what one vendor calls a view, another vendor is gonna call a session. And one session could include dozens of inquiries, but they're not necessarily being counted. So it's an industry-wide problem. There's no easy solution. But the point is, is that people are downloading information with, that they used to find in books, books that they used to check out. So in many cases, we're not able to track the number of inquiries and clicks that people are, are uh, you know, doing. But these charts do not tell the whole story. So books are making a comeback. I'm not sure they ever went anywhere in Amherst. But according to data from the American Booksellers Association and the Association of American Publishers, the number of bookstores in the United States is on the rise and ebook usage is declining. 
hard copy book purchases are growing and sales of ebooks are stagnant. And I have this wonderful quote uh, found in an article titled, Are Ebooks Finally Over? When it comes to travel and convenience, it's hard to beat ebooks. But when it comes to a cozy bookshop visit on a Sunday afternoon, followed by a cup of coffee and your favorite author, nothing beats the real thing. I think that sums up Amherst. Um, Okay. I was recently asked what I thought were the top five most important achievements the library system has accomplished in the seven years I've been here. And certainly one of them has, uh, that we've accomplished is the programming explosion uh, that, that we have going on at the library. So the green chart shows the list of all the different programs we held last year. Uh, there were almost 700 uh, individual programs last year, which is almost 60 per month and about two per day. 57% of those programs for adults, 32% were for children, and 11% were for teenagers. And regarding attendance, almost 15,000 people attended our programs last year. That's 1,250 people per month, or approximately 42 people per day. Children account for 50% of our program attendance, adults 32%, and teens make up 18% of our program attendance. We would never be as successful as we are if it were not for all our community partners. We are so lucky to be located in this incredible town with such a huge heart. Uh, the library is a member of the Chamber, Amherst Arts Night Plus, the Cultural District, and the BID. We have staff liaisons on the Historical Society and the Cultural Council. We run an annual food drive for uh, Food for Fines program, which is going on now, uh, to benefit the Amherst Survival Center. We collaborate with the libraries at all the schools in this town, the colleges, the university. We also host at the library Amherst Community Connections, the League of Women Voters, and the Human's right, Human Rights Commission. So I, I always say we do not succeed alone. I'm going to give you a quick overview of our budget. We will delve much deeper during our budget hearings. So the library relies on several different funding sources to make its operating budget. 74% of the entire operating budget comes from the town appropriation, and that money covers most of our personnel costs. 14% of our budget comes from an annual draw from the library's endowment, and that's valued at about $7.3 million today. This money from the endowment is used for operations, such as our annual CW Mars membership fee, office supplies, utilities, building maintenance, as well as for the remainder of our personnel costs that are not covered by the town appropriation or state aid ward. 6% of our operating budget comes from fundraising. And as I alluded to earlier, this is a really high number for a public library. We take this responsibility and privilege, it really is a privilege, very seriously. So these trustees are committed to maintaining a 4 to 5% draw on the endowment, unlike the 6 to 7% draws which were being taken in the early 2000s. We know the endowment must live on in perpetuity if we want to continue to offer the level and quality of services that we do. So when it comes to closing our fund, our, our budget gap, rather than taking more money out of the endowment, we fundraise. You should also know that all our donations are used to fund books and programming. Uh, as part of our fundraising efforts, uh, one of the things we've established is an annual signature fundraising event called the Sammies, the Samuel Minot Jones Awards for Literary Achievement. This year's event, shameless plug, Thursday, April 26 at 6 p.m. at Amherst College's Converse Hall, we will be honoring Richard Michelson, the Eric Carle Museum, and Bruce Watson. I hope to see you there, and all uh, proceeds from that go towards books and programming. 3%, uh, back to the budget, 3% of the budget comes from our annual state aid award from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Uh, this money is used entirely to pay personnel costs which are not covered by the town. 2% uh, of our budget comes from the Friends and the Woodbury Fund. So the Friends of the Jones Library System is the fundraising arm of the library. And all money that the Friends uh, bring in goes towards public programming and books. Another shameless plug, they're doing mini golf in the library as a fundraiser on February 2nd. It's all day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Come and play. Um, and the remaining 1% comes from fines, fees, and lost books. For our expenses, 66% of our budget goes towards salaries, 
and 15% of our budget goes towards benefits. So from FY18 to FY19, we saw a 23% increase in benefits costs and health insurance, just, just like all the other town departments. But from FY19 to FY20, we're expecting a 3% decrease because we will not be filling two of the positions, two full-time positions, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. 8% of our budget is spent on circulating materials, 4% on operations, 3% on utilities, 2% on CWMARS, that's our library card and interlibrary loan uh, system, 2% on building maintenance, and the remaining 1% is on programming and special collections. I do want to talk about state certification because for any public library, this is everything. Um, without being certified, it, it, it in essence turns your public library into a standalone island. Um, so I want to highlight this aspect of Massachusetts library life because it's so important. Not just because of the annual payment that we receive, but for several other reasons. So certification allows Amherst several benefits, such as the annual state aid award, and for us that's about $90,000. That's a big chunk of money for us. Uh, Amherst residents are allowed to use all other certified public libraries in the state of Massachusetts for free. And that's most of them. There are only about 10 that are not certified. The Jones can participate in the statewide interlibrary loan system and delivery. This is a huge perk. Um, I, 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 I bet most of the people in this room have utilized interlibrary loan um, at least once in the past six months, and um, you know, it, it, it's a vital service. Uh, we can also participate in the public library construction program, and the Jones can also apply for federal LSTA grants, all because we are certified. And so what are the requirements? The town of Amherst must appropriate a certain amount of money each year to the library. And the, uh, the formula is up on the screen, a figure of at least the average of the last three years municipal appropriations to the library increased by two and a half percent. So this is called the municipal appropriation requirement or the MAR. And the, the town of Amherst meets that just fine. The Jones Library must also meet a set of uh, minimum standards. We have to be open to all residents of Massachusetts for free, at least 59 hours per week, at least six days per week. We also have to spend a certain amount of money every year on books. And this is called the Materials Expenditure Requirement, the MER. Um, and for us, that totals just over $200,000. challenges. So I almost didn't include the slide at all. I'm hoping it's making you smile. Um, but, I, 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 you know, because the whole point of me being here is to give you an overview of the library, and the library really is in great shape. We are thriving. Um, but I felt like by not mentioning these couple of issues, it would be the elephant in the room that I would be ignoring. So I know you have questions, so, so I'm going to briefly talk about it. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first, my, my minion has to do with uh, the health insurance cuts. If it weren't for the health insurance problems last year, our financial standing would be excellent. We, the library is a really good place. Uh, donations have doubled in the seven years that I've been here. State aid is funded well by the state, and the endowment is expertly managed. Uh, but health insurance costs have put us in a bind. Our annual state aid award no longer covers the deficit, our share of personnel costs. All our reserves have been spent on personnel um, so that we, we are avoiding layoffs at all costs. Um, we've cut programming in half, uh, and instead of layoffs, uh, two people, two full-time folks just retired, and so we are just not filling those positions. Um, but as I've said before, in order to close this gap, we're focusing heavily on fundraising. And then there's our buildings. So as you know, the North Amherst Library building needs a public restroom and handicapped accessibility. It just does. And then there's the Jones. So don't focus a lot on this slide. I just wanted to say that the Jones building is in need of extensive work to solve its safety, efficiency, and building system problems. Um, combine these issues with the fact that we are unable to serve the underserved in this community, the trustees, both former and current, have known for over a decade that we need to renovate this building. Within the next five to 10 years, the town is gonna have to spend a substantial amount of money on the Jones building, no matter what. All our systems, electrical, HVAC, fire suppression, the atrium needs to be ripped out and started over. They've all come to the end of their lifespans. 
according to an independent cost estimate by a contractor, not an architect, the Band-Aid solution is going to cost, at a minimum, $10 million. The result will still be an unsafe and confusing space. But for $16 million, Amherst will get a library that will serve everyone and will last the next 50 years. I'm really excited to give you tours of, of the buildings, answer all your questions, and, and to work with you on our capital needs. Which leads me beautifully to advocacy. So one of the ways in which public libraries across the whole state work to offset local budget cuts is by advocating on regional and state levels, because we know that state aid is local aid. So the Massachusetts Library Association, the Massachusetts Library System, CW Mars, and the Western Massachusetts Library Advocates each help to bring money to libraries through the MBLC in the form of state aid, funding for networks, that's CW Mars, uh, funding for statewide delivery, that's Optima, and funding for public library construction. So library legislative breakfasts are held each year throughout the state so that library staff, trustees, friends, and town councilors can come and advocate for library funding. This year's Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester district breakfast, which is Joe Comerford's district, uh, will be held at the Jones. And so I hope each of you will be able to attend if you will be in town. I know you all are exhausted and doing so many things, but it would be really great for our legislators, especially since so many of them are new, for them to see you here, there. Um, it really is a wonderful opportunity to advocate for libraries. Uh, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very exciting and exuberant. Um, I, I'm not as exhausted as you guys are. I No. I, we were prepped for your exuberance. <laughs> um, are there questions? And just to comment on this, um, I am not able to attend, but I've already made sure that Mandy Jo will be attending to represent the council. But I urge every one of you to also attend uh, this very important event. Um, yes, Steve. Hi. So my question isn't specifically about the Jones, but it's about library ness. So in states that have functioning counties, oftentimes the counties run the libraries, but are there any cases in Massachusetts? where there are regional libraries? So you realize you're in New England, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for the same reason, uh, yeah. so yes, you're right. It, uh, those county systems work beautifully in the South. Uh, I've been a librarian for almost 30 years now. Uh, I do not see that ever happening in New England, um, and especially in Massachusetts. Uh, and a perfect example of that is all of the communities just in, in Massachusetts who choose to fund branches. So. Everybody loves their library. They love their community library. And um, I, I think residents, most residents are library lovers. They see the benefit to it, and they're going to continue to fund their individual libraries. Thank you. Other questions? Um, could you t uh, tell, I'm sorry, Kathy. Um, it's, a, it's a question I asked you when you gave me the tour. Thank you very much for the tour. but. One of the questions I have is along Steve's line of ways you might pool expenses. And I know what the answer was, but I'd like to probe a little bit more on storage. Um, the amount of the library that's used for storing things that you don't need direct access to. Is there any way of pushing harder on the five college system, which has storage capacity? Um, or could we help as the town council to push harder? Because us building storage capacity either for municipal or for library when there is storage capacity in a sort of shared public space seems to me not a good use of money. Um, hmm. So, so I, I do not know how much, um, only because I, I, I'm just a librarian, I do not know how much this town could push or work with the five college system for access to their bunker. So I, I genuinely, I don't, genuinely don't know. We've ha we have asked, and their policy is that the bunker is reserved for um, their collections. Um, but as far as so storage, I wouldn't necessarily call our 
our collections in need of storage. We need open access to our collections. We are not, not an archive. Uh, we're not an academic library. We are here to open up our doors and our collections to everybody for any moment in time that they may come. Um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't house some collections off-site, but then you've got staffing issues, you've got delivery issues, you know, going back and forth. So it's not, um, the problem with the Jones is not a storage problem. The building is just crumbling around us. So um, it, it's not that we're necessarily looking for more space. In order to participate in this grant program, we have got to provide a library that will work for this community. That's the only way the state will uh, give us money. Um, certainly, if the, if the town decides to pay for the crumblingness uh, on its own, um, then it can do that and it will be able to house and will still be able to rely on interlibrary loan. So I guess what I'm saying, what am I saying? I'm saying our problem is not a storage issue, it's a crumbling building issue. Thank you. Yes, Dorothy. I was interested in your uh, use of the phrase that it, uh, the library should be the town's living room. And uh, I agree with that. And um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on providing a really inviting uh, public space, um, particularly in light of the new um, dis report from the state. Um, I had kind of liked the idea of a first floor room with windows and light. Oh, you mean the, okay, okay. Um, you mean the meeting room. So, uh, Councillor Pam is talking about uh, the MBLC, one of the, requ the only requirement they put on our, uh, on receipt of the construction grant is that we don't have the large meeting room on the first floor. Um, I think that, um, yeah, we were disappointed. Um, but there was so much going on on the first floor, I do agree with them that something had to give. Uh, you know, we want people to come in and, you know, for their first vision to be a, a space that's big enough to house what's going on. So the benefit of it going downstairs into the, uh, the ground level is we will be able to have windows, but on the back end um, and and the fact that it will be open up to the CVS parking lot, which may or may not one day be a parking garage, uh, so people will be able to park there safely and no longer have, have, have to cross the busy Amity Street, and they just walk in and they can use the meeting room after hours. So um, I, I do think it will still be an inviting space even with that move downstairs. Thank you for asking. I wondered if you might like to introduce your trustees that are here. Sure, I think we have uh, Trustee Bob Pam mm -hmm. and uh, Trustee Alex Lefave. Okay, thank She's you. She's not waving, but you're there. Great. Really? Chris Hoffman was here too. Okay. He, he, trustee, yeah, for he's been around a while. Yes. Okay. Other questions. Yes, I'm sorry, Main I have two. Um, you talked about a, I'll, I'll actually I'll ask the other one first. Um, we're in the MLBC program and there's a list and all of that. So I was curious and wondering whether you've got an idea of when we might be actually granted the money that the council will then have to potentially deal with. And then the other one is you had a lot of services there. Um, a lot of programs, a lot of services. What are the ones that are used most? What a fun question. Okay, so let me start with the chart that I told you to ignore. Um, so this is, a, it's, a, it's a draft timeline and it can change at any moment. Um, and with regards to the MBLC's public library construction program, it, another, a new construction bond needs to be passed. So this is one of the reasons that coming to the legislative breakfast is a, so important because we need to advocate for that. Um, the guess is that we will be given the, our money during FY21. So that's what is showing up there during FY21. So that could be in July of 2020 or later. Um, 
And what will happen is the MBLC will say, okay, Amherst, you're up, you're at the top of the list, we've got the money, uh, you need to uh, get your town's approval for your share of the money. And so I put there, trustees seek extension. Um, it, it depends on where we're gonna be in a year and a half. Normally, once we get the announcement, we have six months to come to town council and get the approval. Uh, if you guys are not ready for that, if you're not in a good place, we can ask the MBLC for a six month uh, uh, extension. And so that's what I have assumed here, uh, so which me would mean in July of 22, as an example, July of 21, which is FY22, um, we would need to get a commitment from town council for the 15.9. Um, and let's say that happens, that's when design development starts and we would move into temporary quarters. This is a really important piece of this puzzle, uh, temporary quarters. We're not gonna be closed for two years. We, uh, by law, uh, we have to provide all the same library services that we are providing uh, now. Um, so we will be doing that and we'll be working with the town to find a place to uh, hang out for two years. Um, construction begins and ends in a couple of years after that. So this is the guess. It could change. If the bond bill doesn't pass, it'll take longer. Um, but there still are, we're fourth on the wait list right now. There are three other projects in front of us. Um, so that's the, the building project. And what services are, provide, are, are enjoyed the most? Is that what you were saying? So, um, oh, well, I hope all the staff aren't listening because it's not good to choose your favorites. But um, <laughs> I would say the children's room staff, you know, I've always said that in any public library, the heart is the children's room. I mean, that's, that's you know, that's the activity, that's the action, and there's nothing more cute than all these little kids and books and awesome. Um, so, you know, you've got a lot of families coming to all of these events, and so I, I would say that's the most active, um, followed pretty closely by the adult programs. Um, I think we had, I think according to the slide, I think there were more adult programs, but adult programs tend to attract fewer people. You know, we can have a ma uh, magician and 150 kids are gonna come, um, but we don't have magicians for adults, so fewer people come to their stuff. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Kathy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stay with the, the funding issue. Uh, does the, the 16 million from the town assumes that you're also able to raise a substantial amount of money separately to get to the total? Yes, great question. So under capital campaign, uh, we've already done a feasibility study and it looks like we can raise 2.9 million. And we'll also be going for historic tax credits uh, uh, for a total of 3.1, so you're exactly right. So 15.9, um, I'm thinking is the minimum amount we would ask for the town. Um, Anything that we raise, this is important, anything that we raise is going to offset that $35.6 million uh, budget. The budget is not going to increase. This is the price tag. It's not gonna change. So um, if costs skyrocket, cuts will have to be made. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. I, so. I was just doing the math of the 35 million minus the 13 and it didn't come to 60. You've gotta raise a substantial amount of money 2.9, 3.1, and 15.9. It's very possible I screwed that up. <laughs> and then the 13.7. The 16, carry the one. <laughs> Nine. Yeah, I think it's all there. 35.6, so the parts are 13.7 from the grant, 15.9 from the town, 2.9 from the capital campaign, and 3.1 for historic tax credits. Do other pieces. Those four pieces equal 35.6. And does, it, does that include the temporary headquarters for you? That is within the budget, yes. And where are you on the capital campaign besides your feasibility study? Uh, I'm so glad you asked. We start. We are starting up our feasibility committee uh, again tomorrow, and that's one of the things we'll be talking about. Is your timeline for the capital campaign? Yes. Okay. That's one of the things. Okay. Yes, Mandy Jo. So you said the budget number, that 35.6 is not changing but 
we all know construction costs are going up. I've heard from previous presentations you've gone that the size of the building really can't change because of um, the library, state library rules. Um, so what gives then? <laughs> no, that's a great question. question. And the, the way the process works, so I, I've only, I've been involved in one other project. I was the library director when we built the Sunderland Library. And so you set the budget and it's the only downside to the program. You know, if you were at home, you would be able to make adju adjustments with your own checking account. But um, municipal contracts work very differently. So, um, the money will be in a pot and slowly things change and move on and change orders are gonna happen. There's no such thing as a perfect building project and costs will go up. Sometimes costs go down. Sometimes uh, uh, when they're opening the bids, they're lower than you thought, but, but usually not. So smaller things can change like finishes, um, uh, you know, carpeting and tile and we may want we may want finish A, but we may have to choose uh, finish B. Um, there are those kinds of cuts that are made, uh, you know, furnishings. We could end up having to buy fewer chairs, for example, but um, it's so far out that it, it's impossible to say exactly. But in my experience, that's the way it ends up working. And what percentage contingency do you have in there? I'm going to say 5%, but I'm pulling that out of my head. Okay. I'd have to look. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you all so much. And we want to thank the trustees for joining you. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, are there any comments from the council at this time? OK. Then uh, we do have a period for public comment. Is there anybody who would like to make a public comment? Yes. You re I just want to repeat what I always have to, and that is that we invite you to make a public comment. We do not respond. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Kent Ferber. I was a trustee of the Jones Library from 97 to 2000. I started the annual fund. And after a lifetime of work in the nonprofit sector, I've gotten back involved in the library. So I will be very much involved in the fundraising that you'll hear more about. Uh, I have three things to say. First of all, I'd like you not to uh, come to any conclusions about the shape of this project or its funding because we're a long ways away from the kind of details that you are asking about. Um, secondly, um, it, it, with respect to however uh, off-site storage of books. I just want to emphasize something that maybe Sharon didn't emphasize enough, which is the, this is not a uh, research library. This is a browsing library, and it should stay that way, and this town council should make sure that it stays that way. Our object is to attract people to the library, to see what's there, to enjoy it, and um, not necessarily to provide access to everything on the shelves at all time, but to provide enough on the shelves to justify the visit there. And thirdly, <clears throat> excuse me, you made reference to the exuberance of our director. And I would like to second that and to indicate that that is precisely why I am involved in working with this library, not Sharon's personality so much and why you should be involved with this library because as libraries are now in the process of being transformed, we need a different kind of librarian. We need a librarian who isn't a conservator only. We need a librarian who says to this community, this is where you should come to get together and to appreciate and enjoy the legacy that these books bring you. That's a different kind of librarian than maybe we have thought we needed in the past, and we're lucky to have that kind of librarian now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? Um, let me just mention to the council, uh, I don't know where we stand on the poll, but we are polling in February for another two to four hours to finish off the various educational uh, opportunities uh, that we've been putting together with the town. And so please make sure you've answered that poll. Uh, Andy, did you have something? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing um, <clears throat> to my colleagues on the council. Uh, we've had some really wonderful presentations that have uh, described to us the work of uh, many of our departments. And uh, speaking mostly about, for a second, about municipal, but also it, reply, it, it refers to others. We received in the material that was given to us before we were sworn in at, one, at that um, orientation session at the university, um, a number of books, that, um, one of which was the budget book. And um, mine is a little different because it's in the notebook style from my having been on the select board. But I wanted to just um, encourage you to take a look at it again in relation to the departments that you have seen. For example, we started um, early on with public works and uh, there was a number of um, different parts of public works that were described. Um, each of those is described fully within the budget book. It talks about the mission of the, each of the departments that we have. It provides um, information about the accomplishments that have been made recently in each of the departments, the short-term goals and the long-term goals. The accomplishments frequently contain statistics. A lot of the um, police statistics yesterday on arrests, for example, are in the annual budget book. So for those of us who've tracked annual budget books from year to year, we can um, look at the trends and see the trends, and some of those trends are within the material presented. So if you really um, want to understand the tie-in between what we've been hearing and the budget, I would encourage you to look at the town manager's budget book and the budgets um, for the library and schools. Thank you. Anything else at this time? And just a moment, um, Mr. Bachman, can you tell us which other town departments we would be meeting with? So the ones that have not had an opportunity to present include the Council on Aging, the Economic Development Department, the Health Director, um, there's one or two others, I mean, oh, L, uh, LSSE, those are the four big ones, and Hound Clerk. <laughs> <laughs> she does Thanks have another the job. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh, Town Clerk, no, right. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, anything else? Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? Second. Got a second over here. All those in favor, raise your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you.